Good evening, this is Quintus Curtius. Welcome back to the podcast. And in this podcast, I'm going to talk about the power of art and the power of dreams and how these two forces can converge together to produce things of real merit and real quality. And specifically, I'm going to talk about a documentary movie I saw recently, a couple of weeks ago, and I haven't had a chance to talk about it since I saw it. I've been focused on getting this latest book published, this book uh, Digest, a collection of essays. With, so that's finally, finally done. It's all out there. But uh, the movie I'm talking about was such a wonderful documentary, one of those hidden gems that you discover accidentally and you can't believe your good fortune. And the movie is called Sad Hill Unearthed. That's the English translation. It's a Spanish film. The original title is um, uh, Desenterrando Sad Hill. Desenterrando Sad Hill. Uh, Sad Hill Unearthed. And it's directed by a Spanish director. I think his name is um, Guillermo de Oliveira. Guillermo de Oliveira. And it was made in 2017, so it's a couple years old. But um, uh, you know, I was really touched by this movie. Not just because I'm a fan. It, the, the, the movie, well, let me explain f- the, the, the premise of what, what this is about. The, the basic premise of this documentary, it's about four friends who live in rural, rural Spain in the province of uh, Burgos. And uh, they set out to locate and to restore the film set cemetery that was used for the climax of the, the 1965 film, uh, the, uh, the uh, Sergio Leone film, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, which stars uh, Clint Eastwood, Eli Wallach, and uh, Lee Van Cleef. It's, a, it's an iconic film, a very, very famous film. I, I, I shouldn't even have to describe it. I assume you've all seen it, but you never know. You just never know. But uh, this this movie, this uh, great epic western, was filmed in Spain. And the movie was released in 1965. And for the climax of the film, which is a shootout which takes place at a, a cemetery in the middle of nowhere called the Sad Hill Cemetery, there was a special set built for this. The, um, the director, Sergio Leone, had, had the Spanish army. He was able to get the Spanish army to construct this very, very moving cemetery in the middle. Where it, it, it's, a, it's a very unique type of cemetery. It looks almost like a Roman amphitheater. You've got a central uh, inlaid stone circle surrounded by successive concentric rings of graves. And there are thousands of graves in this cemetery, or mock graves in this cemetery. And the set was built in the, uh, you know, I assume in 1964, 65. The movie was released in 65, so I assume it was built, you know, just a few months, you know, during the shooting of the, the, the movie. And the scene, the, the climactic shootout scene is very, very powerful. I don't really want to go into... The details of that. If you haven't seen the movie, just see the movie. You'll know what I'm talking about. This Sergio Leone's westerns are, are operatic in scope and 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 some of the grandest spectacles you'll ever see on film. And the good and the bad and the ugly is probably considered by most to be the the greatest of the this trilogy that he made with uh, Clint Eastwood, The Man with No Name. Uh, the first one was uh, Fistful of Dollars. Then there's uh, For a Few Dollars More, and then there's The Good, The Bad, and the Ugly. In any case, this fantastic climax to the good, the bad, and the ugly was was uh, was shot in uh, in the Burgos province in Spain, and somehow, just the way life works, the the set was abandoned, obviously, and forgotten all these years. It's been like fifty years now. This is 1965. It's fifty years ago. And uh, what's very touching about this movie is it explains the vision about how these four friends, uh, how this movie meant so much to them. They were so moved by this film. They were so touched by this film that they set out to locate this site and to actually restore it at their own expense. Now, keep in mind, 
They had no official backing for this. They had no official sanction for this. They had no official permission to do this. They just thought it up and did it. You know, and I thought, when I saw that, I thought, wow, that really bespeaks the power of art, the power of a singular vision to motivate men to accomplish worthy deeds. Because to them, this site was more than just a movie set. It was in many ways an arena for the playing out of that eternal struggle, that eternal struggle between good and evil, maybe, perhaps. And for them, this meant something. This really meant something. And they interviewed these guys who found the cemetery. And they each described how this quest meant something to them. There was one guy that talked about, in a very moving way, about the loss of his father. And he talked about how the loss of his father somehow motivated him to do this as a tribute to his father. Some of these guys actually had relatives who worked on them as extras in the movie. And they each described in their own personal way what this meant to them. But yet the common thread between all four of these descriptions was something special. It was the power of art, the power of the literary vehicle to move men to accomplish great deeds. And about... I think I think what the film also shows us is that uh, we need to have these types of idealistic visions, and we need to carry out these maybe to some people quixotic quests, which might be to some people futile or useless. But it doesn't matter what other people think. What matters is does the quest mean something to you? What does it mean to you? How does it relate to your life? Those are the questions that need to be answered. And we'll, we'll come back to that in a little bit. But the movie describes successively, step by step, how they found this cemetery, which was amazing. You know, they, there's an overhead shot where they, the camera pulls back far above the, the cemetery and they show how the, the growth of the vegetation over the decades has almost completely obscured this. It almost looks like an archaeological site. And the, um, the iconic arena is now you know, covered over with grass and weeds so that they actually had to scrape away seven inches of, of topsoil and vegetation and weeds to get to this. And, you, and you're watching this and you're like, wow, this is, this is impressive. The vision to do that, the will to do that, is impressive. And of course, like many such enterprises, they underestimated the amount of time and the amount of money that it would take to do this. Because they quickly realized that this was a massive undertaking. You know, in, in the 60s, you could draft, you know, a regiment of Spanish soldiers. You know, this was back in the era when, when uh, you know, uh, uh, the general, General Franco could just say, okay, he'd take take a, a battalion or a regiment out there and just order them to, to do that, and it was done. You can't, can't really do that now. So they had to enlist volunteers, and a sizable number of volunteers showed up. And someone even came up with a very nice idea of, um, you know, to finance the project of sponsoring uh, these, uh, these uh, uh, ersatz graves these fake graves, you know, you could, you could buy, quote unquote, buy a, a head, a headstone, well, not a headstone, but a, you could buy a, a wooden, a wooden cross to put uh, whatever name you wanted to put on there to basically as a way of sponsoring, a way of raising money. And so, so they, uh, they, they carried out this restoration and it doesn't look exactly like the movie does, of course. I mean, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, you can't really reproduce precisely the, the, the scene that existed at the time, but it's, it's pretty much restored. You know, I think to, to the, and I think maybe successive generations can maybe continue on it and, and maintain it. And, you know, it's, it, it looks like such a wonderful site. 
And I thought, you know, if I ever do, and I, I, I am at some point in the future planning to visit Madrid. I, I, I do want to visit Spain uh, this year. And uh, I'm really thinking, you know, when I do, I'm going to, I'm going to travel up there. I'm going to, it's only, a, I don't think, I think it's only a few hours drive. I'm going to go visit that place. I'm going to go visit that place. And I want to stand. I want to stand where those actors stood, where that, that fantastic climax was shot. Because like the, 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 the restorers in the movie say, even if it doesn't matter to anybody else, it matters to us. It matters to them. The movie meant something to them. And maybe the movie, I mean, there's a lot of themes to the movie. The, the, uh, maybe the, the pathos of life in general, the futility of, of dreams, and maybe the redemptive power of goodness, maybe. But what I got out of this documentary and why I think it's important and why I think this was worth me making a podcast about are, are, are two things, two things that I think we should take away from this. Number one is the power of art. And film is art, make no mistake. The power of art to inspire us to great things. Never underestimate the power of art, the power of a book, the power of a painting, the power of a film, the power of a sculpture to inspire greatness, to inspire us to create, uh, to create great things from the lofty ideals that we're imbued with by this artwork. And the second thing is that if you have a vision to do something that's based on a sincere and honest desire that you got from some artistic work or some book or something like that, pursue that. Pursue that dream, even if everybody else thinks it's a waste of time, even if everybody else thinks it's nonsense, even if everyone else scoffs at it. What matters is, what does it mean to you? What does it mean to you? Because if you don't start bringing to fruition your own goals, your own ambitions, your own ideas, you're never going, going to amount to anything. Because, you know, money comes and goes, people come and go, but what really matters our human values. What really matters are those aesthetics of life, those aesthetics which constitute life itself. And I really thought this movie brought home that wonderful, wonderful ideal, that fantastic ideal. And I thought, boy, what a, what a worthy, what a worthy use of time and effort to do something like this. Bravo. Well done. Well done, gentlemen. Well done, gentlemen. And I hope that someday I can set foot there and I can say, yeah, I made it here. I made it here. And, you know, there are some very nice uh, scenes at the end. There's a very When they actually finish this restoration, the final scenes, they have a dedication night. And the local people from the local villages come and populate this arena, this great arena in the middle of nowhere. And they bring in, uh, they bring in the, um, you know, this large uh, television screen, and they play, they play some messages. I think from Ennio Morricone, who he, he he's the, the 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 composer, the conductor, the composer who who uh, crafted the incredible music for the movie. And he still looks very good. It, I think he's, I think he's in his, his late eighties now. And even Clint Eastwood appears on the screen to to offer his his well wishes, to offer his. Uh, his thanks. And I thought that was a very touching, very, very touching moment. So, so think about that. Desenterrando Sad Hill. Unearthing Sad Hill. All right. Well, that'll be all for tonight. Until next time, I'm Quintus Curtius. Good night. <laughs>